Hello, everyone. My name is Anae Agostini. I'm CEO of ID Insurance Program. I want to welcome you all to our professional liability for architects and engineers and contractors. This is a very stable uh, book of business that um, most brokers are intimidated by, but I'm thank you for joining us and being brave enough to learn more about this uh, great class of business to go after. I want to introduce our um, our uh, professional underwriter, Lexi Johnson, uh, of course, that is with CID Insurance Programs. And then um, our instructor today is going to be Jay Vora, uh, the professional liability regional manager of Hiscox. He's bringing some great uh, expertise uh, to the table today, and we welcome him. Uh, and then last but not least, Jacob Cole is our marketing coordinator, uh, and he take make sure that everything goes smoothly behind the scenes. So let's talk about logistics. As you know, everyone will be uh, def uh, defaulted to mute, um, but your, your voice is really important to us, so please pose them in the chat room at any time throughout the webinar, and we will stop and, and um, answer them as we go. There's a short survey again, uh, at the end of the webinar, and it will appear just at the very end. We really would appreciate your feedback there as well uh, so that we could keep improving our webinars to do a better job for you. So without further ado, let's go ahead and I'll turn this over to Jay. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, just a quick introduction to myself, Jay Vore. I've been at Hiscox for um, coming up to 10 years uh, now. Um, born and raised in the UK, as you can probably tell from the weird accent, but um, been, I've been in the US for seven years underwriting uh, architects and engineers. Um, so really what I'm hoping uh, that we get out of, out of this is just to kind of explain some of the necessary coverages um, for these classes, um, learn about the broad business uh, appet class appetite, um, and also recognize why some of these classes need professional liability, right? So we'll be covering anything from um, architects and engineers, your, your kind of traditional design professionals, all the way through to um, contractors and subcontractors, where where often the, the requirement or need for professional liability is, is misunderstood. So hopefully we can uh, debunk some myths around that too. Um, and also just to let you know about a new product that we have at Hiscox called Contractors Key, a very niche product um, just as a response to the market to try and help us get those foot in the doors um, with small subcontractors and contractors um, so we can kind of really sell them on the value of the form and the coverages. So if you could turn over to the next slide. So we'll go over to this in, in a lot more detail here, but I just wanted to provide this snapshot um, just to kind of show you, you know, one of the benefits of different forms um, is the specific coverages they get. So typically speaking, all, all forms are going to be based on professional liability, um, but depending on whether you're a design professional, a general contractor or subcontractors, there are different exposures that exist from a PR perspective. Um, and they, they, they vary depending on what type of contractor you are. Um, so really big takeaway from here is um, if they are really a contractor or a subcontractor, um, oftentimes the, a simple design professional product isn't really going to give them the true coverage they need for the exposures that they face. Um, you know, I, I like to use the term, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So um, what we do see a lot is people trying to convince you it's a fish, right? So they're trying to convince you it's just a design professional, but we have a pretty good understanding with 15 years in this marketplace, about 100 years as a company uh, in insurance, of, of what our clients look like. And we always try to tailor our approach to what those clients are so they can get the true peace of mind, which is ultimately what they're paying for uh, with the coverage. So starting off um, on architects and engineers. So what, what is this in a nutshell? Um, it's professional liability coverage and defense for third party claims arising out of professional services um, to, performed by the architects and engineers. Um, this can cover anything from sole practitioners, um, one man bands, um, all the way through to large professional firms um, for any alleged error or omission resulting out of professional services rendered. Now, services here are often very, very broad, right? So it's really any type of 
architect or engineering services uh, includes um, construction managers too. Um, and, and, and it's pretty standard for the market that rather than list out the specific thing that the insured does, they'll, they'll rely on this very blanket um, definition of professional services just to make sure we, 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 we've got as much of a catch-all as possible. Um, other key coverages here are waiver of subrogation. They're often required that by contracts. Blanket additional insured language, uh, which again, they're often required that by contracts. Um, and technology services and use of drones. So this is really when we talk about that, that more ancillary stuff, not I'm creating a tech platform, but, uh, but rather I am using technology or drones to help me deliver that professional service. So a land surveyor will be a great example of that. They might be using a drone from up top to, sur to survey a land or take certain photos of boundaries and stakes, um, but their professional service is land surveying. No, not anything to do with the actual drones itself. Um, and then another piece of coverage is media liability coverage, um, which you know we'll also touch upon too. So as I just mentioned about the broad classes of um, business, so you know this product can cover anything from architects, civil engineers, construction managers, um, land surveyors, but even like consultants, so technical consultants um, and fire protection consultants and even inspectors, so crane elevator welding inspectors, where they, you know in those situations they are essentially signing off on the safety and the um, fit for use of cranes, elevators, weldings, um, and therefore they ultimately become on the hook for um, the integrity of the design at the end of the day uh, because they signed off um, and said it was fit for purpose. Uh, in terms of coverages to consider um, here, so um, definitely consider blanket additional insured coverage um, for acts arising out of the uh, named insured services. Um, it is almost standard in this industry um, that clients will require this um, and you know we don't expect all our clients to always know the intricacies of every contract that they sign they're not lawyers at the end of the day um, and so that's why we make this blanket it one reduces the reporting burden on the insured um, and also just make sure that they're, they're not getting into um, issues as it pertains to um, as it pertains to you know, contract, breach of contract and stuff like that because they didn't get the right coverage. Now, another thing to kind of know about A&E is usually when things go wrong in A&E, they sue everybody, even if the insured didn't do anything wrong. Um, they might have had a very, very small part to play in a very, very large project, uh, but where there's where there's money to be had, the lawyers will typically go after everybody. Um, and so blanket AI is very important. And also, um, you know, just generally that nature of defense. Oftentimes we see with um, uh, insureds, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. And that's, you know, well and good. And, you know, we, we obviously prefer those types of insureds. Um, but at the end of the day, just because they get brought into it, sometimes claims can really add up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars just to defend them in a claim. Um, and I think sometimes that's a part of insurance that insureds less think about is the, is the cost they might incur first party without insurance, even if they didn't do anything wrong. Um, blanket waiver of subrogation to clients, that essentially means that if the um, insured agrees via a contract, um, that they waive their rights to subrogate against their client, um, i.e. go after that client, um, that we will also waive that right too. Also consider coverage for IP infringement claims um, and also think about recommending a 70-30 settlement clause. So what does this mean? Oftentimes you'll see in an insurance contract um, that there is a settlement clause and what that means is if um, we agree that we think we can close a, a, a claim for X number of dollars, um, that anything above that, if the insured rejects that, then anything above that is either not covered by the insurance carrier at all, sometimes maybe only the indemnity piece is covered, um, or sometimes it's a 50-50. Now, at Hiscox, we provide quite a liberal 70-30 settlement clause here um, that means that for any damages in excess of that recommended settle amount 
and any additional defense costs in excess of that of the time from where we made that settlement um, case that we will cover 70% of that and the insured will be um, liable for 30% 30, 30 of that. So um, it's more generous than, than a lot of other markets uh, out there. So it's, 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 it's something, again, often overlooked, but in the case you need to use it um, pretty substantially in terms of the cost savings for the insured. Um, another piece to, to think about often overlooked is media and advertising coverage. So you see this more and more in the digital space um, nowadays that maybe if you're a design professional and you're, you're pretty proud of a work that you've done on a certain project, um, so you might add that project to your website. Now, if you haven't got the right sign-offs um, to use a certain trademark of a project or um, to advertise that project, um, you can get kind of in trouble. Think about your just general media um, trademark infringement coverage. Um, now, in, in many cases of the law across the US, um, you, you have to, if you are found liable for this, you have to pay per click. So it could be, for example, only $50 per click. But if you're working on a, on a large apartment homes with maybe 200 projects on there, so maybe you get 1,000 clicks, 1,000 times 50 uh, adds up pretty quickly. So again, something not often thought about, but more and more in the digital world um, does, become, uh, does become an issue, and it can rack up pretty quickly on a per click basis. Uh, we also include crisis management coverage, that's pretty standard across uh, many markets here, um, and importantly, pre-claims assistance. Um, pre-claims assistance essentially is the ability for an insured to utilize our claims team uh, in the event that something happens, but it's not yet a claim. Often that's super important for a client because they're trying to, the earlier they engage with our claims, the better we can advise them on, on on how maybe to approach this claim, how to prepare for it, um, certain steps and actions they can take now to make their lives easier, maybe sal salvage some reputation with the um, with the client too. Um, so that's really, really important. And our claims team does have a lot of experience in handling a lot of design claims. Um, so, so they are quite well versed on, on how to help there. And, and the big thing is here is if, if that claim so if that event never turns into a claim, we won't add that onto loss rent. So it's about 50K of coverage that we provide there, and they could use up to 50K, and we won't even add it to the loss runs if it doesn't turn into a claim. So a nice little add me on there. Um, additionally, we have defensive licensing, uh, FHA, OSHA, ADA regulations, um, and we also provide supplementary payment sublimits, um, particularly around subpoena assistance, um, kind of coming back to that earlier point about how, um, how how when a suit happens, they usually bring in everybody. So again, small sublimits, but actually when you need to use them, um, pretty useful. So just to bring this to life a little bit, uh, we've got an example here of a claim, um, electrical engineer. So in this situation, the architect was hired by a developer for the design of a shopping center. Due to errors in design and specification, uh, the developer's contractor was unable to proceed with construction on schedule, and the project was delayed by about six months. So as a result, the developer incurs a financial loss arising out of the additional construction costs and loss of rental income because they can't get tenants into that shopping center. How our A&E policy would respond is it would provide defense and indemnity for claims arising out of the architect, out of the electrical engineer's negligence and E&O exposure, right? So the developer's the third party that the electrical engineer has provided services to, and that third party is suing uh, due to financial loss because of the construction costs, additional construction costs and the loss of rental income. And our policy will, will step in um, to provide defense and a potential indemnity um, as it kind of plays out in the courts. So, so then moving on from there, um, let's get into contractors professional liability. So, um, you know, oftentimes you'll hear the term contractors, but there is a slight differentiator between a general contractor and a subcontractor. So 
you know, for us, when we think about general contractors, we're looking at design build farms, construction farms, at risk construction managers. When we're looking at subcontractors, we're thinking about trade artisan specialists. So your painters, your plumbers, your HVACs, um, electrical contractors, they, they're doing a very specific job. Uh, where a general contractor, contractor is typically managing the wider project. Now, this is a product where, um, you know, for contractors, there's obviously a clear GL need, um, but often it's quite overlapped. Like, what is my PL exposure? Why, why do I need this coverage? So, uh, on this slide, I just kind of left with a couple of foods for thought in terms of questions to ask these insureds. Um, to try to assess whether they have a PL exposure. So uh, with general contractors, do they provide any pre-construction advice or value engineering? Do they self-perform or are they, do they delegate design services? Now, the second piece is really important. Just because they might not be doing the design services themselves, if they are responsible for delegated design, they can essentially get brought up in very, very similar claims because they, they're there to select the design professional and oversee the design professional. And thus, the they, they, uh, professional liability need is created. Um, also, do they have any concerns about design-related cost overruns and delays too, right? So those three questions, if they answer kind of yes to any of those, um, generally, there's a need for professional liability insurance. Sub subcontractors, kind of similar type of stuff, but do you self-perform design services? Often, you know, they, they might be in, involved in even a slight amount of design services, and then you're really kind of picked up for the whole thing. Do they have water intrusion, mold, or asbestos concerns? Um, and also, have they incurred any rework costs due to claims for faulty work or faulty materials on completed jobs? We'll go into a, a little bit of detail of what those all mean uh, in a second, but. Those three questions, if they answer yes to any of those, um, there's generally a need. The, the, the last thing I just wanted to point out here is with general contractors and subcontractors in particular, um, oftentimes the need is also driven just by the fact that they have um, a contract. So more and more we're seeing general contractors and subcontractors being required to hold professional liability insurance. Um, and so I just want to use this one slide here just to kind of show you the snapshot of the differences between them. So, you know, with a general contractor, you're going to get the um, broad professional liability definition. You're going to get true full contractors pollution. You're going to get rectification, protecting of indemnity, um, and media. We can add faulty workmanship if there is self perform if they are self performing a certain trade, right? So if they do the electrical contracting themselves as well as being the wider general contractor. On the artisan subcontractors, um, it's mostly the same. Um, in this situation though, we don't add protective indemnity uh, to this policy um, because for the most part, that really sits with the general contractor and the subcontractor shouldn't be picking it up. Um, and, and therefore we, we try to draw the line in the sand. Just again, in that spirit of everyone can get sued for everything, often if if the insurance coverage exists, they'll try to ding it there and the applicants and subcontractors needs to draw a line between what they are responsible for and what they're not responsible for. So, so kind of digging into some of these coverages uh, a little bit in detail. So um, general contractors, why it sells. So professional liability, uh, very similar to the A&E that we just talked about, right? Uh, any claims alleging negligent design, engineering, construction, management, consulting services performed by you or on your behalf. That on your behalf being key for a lot of contractors. Um, contractors, pollution, liability, and emergency response. Um, so this can be on most policies. Now, one of the nice things about our forms, um, and this applies for all the other coverages from contractors and down here, if the Insured doesn't want it, our form can be very flexible to just remove it. Um, and why is that important for contractors' pollution? Is oftentimes a contractor might have a standalone um, pollution policy. So they don't really want to pay for pollution on the PL when they already have a standalone option. So that's okay. You just request that in your submission. 
please provide PR without pollution um, and our underwriters will underwrite accordingly um, without that coverage. Saves a little bit of money, avoids a little bit of duplication, so it's a, it's a bit of a win-win. Rectification expenses, um, this, is, this is a really key piece. So we provide rectification expenses and what that really does is uh, it advances funds directly to the insured to rectify a design error to get the project back on track, avoid, avoiding any potentially costly lawsuits um, and claims. So it, it's really kind of time is of the essence matters. Um, one of the things to make sure if you see rectification in, in, in any policy is what are the requirements of it. Um, ours is kind of notification and sign off from us, but there are some policies out there that will require you to sue the um, design professional if it's delicated design. Now, I just be a little wary of just because they call that rectification, that's really protective and it's not the same thing. Um, rectification is time is of the essence. You need to correct something pretty quickly to prevent it becoming an issue. And it's also really important because your ability to do that helps you save face with the client. It helps you protect your reputation. Often these industries work, uh, rely a lot on uh, word of mouth and, and reputation. Um, so a, a key piece of coverage um, that we often see utilized by our insurers. Um, we also then have protective indemnity. Um, this covers the insured's financial loss arising out of a act or ENO of a subcontracted design professional. So in this situation, you do have to make the claim against the responsible design professional, but essentially what it's doing is if, for example, you are getting sued um, because of negligent design on somebody who you, you used, um, you know, you subcontracted that design out. Um, and maybe, for example, the suit is 700,000, um, but they only can pay 500,000, maybe the, the, the insured limits. Um, then you're still on the hook for that extra $200,000, right? So that's where this protective indemnity piece gets picked in there. Um, but it also picks in um, first party losses too, right? So the general contractor itself might also run into um, costs they incur because of um, overruns or delays, right? Maybe rescheduling contractors, um, you know, um, if they need to store certain materials, you know, certain locations in, in, you know, rainier climates, probably not the ones we see a lot in Southern California, but in, in rainier climates, you can't just leave all the materials out there. Um, so you might have to get temporary storage and, and, and all sorts of different things. Um, just to protect those. That's a first party loss that the general contractor will incur um, and, the, and our policy can step in and help cover some of those costs. Um, crisis management, so we provide 50K as a supplement on crisis management. So this is a really around like uh, media response and kind of protecting the client's um, reputation um, in the event of a claim. So just think about sometimes claimants like to make big news stories out of it or they, they, they want to spread it all on Twitter or on Instagram and things like that. And that, that can do a lot of damage to a client's reputation. And this is where that crisis management piece uh, steps in there. Um, and then media and advertising liability, like we, uh, like we discussed earlier, I won't go over that one again, um, but really around your own advertising, advertising of your own services, which it breaches on somebody else's uh, image rights or trademarks. So subcontractors are broadly similar. Um, I won't go over kind of too, too much too much over here, um, but we're really kind of talking very similar coverages. Um, but you know, like like we talked about before, critically, there's no um, there's no protective indemnity um, because it it really isn't appropriate for a subcontractor. Um, but what there is is faulty workmanship. Now. 40 workmanship is a really critical piece of um, coverage here for subcontractors because what it does is it bridges the gap between PL and GL. So what I mean by that is typically on a GL policy, it has a your work exclusion. So it only covers third party BIPD, um, but it, it excludes cost to repair and replace faulty work or defective products. So um, to, to kind of try to bring that to life a little bit real quick, um, if I think about maybe I did some faulty work on a bathroom installation in an apartment um, that caused the dodgy pipe, which caused flooding to the neighbors downstairs. Now, my GL would pick up the BIPD um, caused to my neighbors downstairs. 
However, we've still got to go and fix um, this bathroom, right, that has been installed incorrectly. So that might involve ripping out the showers because maybe that pipe is, you know, well well underneath all of the uh, the bathtubs and whatever. So they've got to rip that all out, they've got to fix it, and then they've got to put the, the, the bathroom back together, essentially. All of that cost isn't picked up by a GL, and that's a cost that the subcontractor subcontractor directly incurs when you start scaling up projects from small bathroom renovations into uh, much much larger projects or much fancier homes um, the costs here being incurred can be uh, can add up pretty quickly um, and isn't covered by any other insurance so um, you know certainly with subcontractors where they may not be cash flow uh, rich for lack of a better term um, this is a really important coverage because they can kind of get wiped out sometimes because they don't have the cash to fix their problems. Um, so we just talked about faulty workmanship. Um, if we move over to um, pollution claim to the next slide. So I just uh, one one forward okay thank you um so i just want to give an example of a pollution claim that can arise that we would pick up so um a concrete subcontractor did not properly ventilate one of the buildings after completing the pour of a concrete um, as a result the floors walls and texture and fixtures develop mold so the contractor's gl policy would deny coverage here cite, citing the mold and pollution exclusion on the gl policy However, an artisan professional liability policy with pollution coverage would cover the cost to clean up and to repair and replace any damage caused by that mold condition. So again, the GL policy is great, but it's not all encompassing. Um, so hopefully these are a couple of real life scenarios that bring out you know, the, the importance of a professional liability uh, claim when it comes to artisan subcontractors. Um, and then, Two more here on the back end. Um, general contractors, onto the next slide, please. General contractors here, so a construction uh, professional liability claim. So a contractor has an engineer to design the shoring of a site excavation for a commercial building. The design of that shoring was inadequate and resulted in a settlement damage to the neighboring building. The building owner filed a claim against the subcontractor, but the Contractor's GL policy denies coverage as a result, as the damage resulted from engineering services, um, and that's a pretty standard exclusion, right? So any any claims out of professional services. Um, a general contractor's PL policy would cover could cover um, coverage for engineering professional services, as well as provide defense for the building owner's claims. So again, another example of where the GL wouldn't pick up and we would. Um, and then finally, contractors protective indemnity. Um, GC hires electrical engineer for an industrial food plant. The electrical design was inadequate um, for the facility specs. The GC incurs two million in additional rework costs and the owner incurs um, 800K. Sorry, the GC incurs two million in additional rework costs and 800k in owner delay penalties um, due to a four month delay um, if the electrical engineer carried one million in limits only the gc protective policy would indemnify the gc so for for the unsatisfied amount of 1.8 million so it's a 2.8 million um, in costs but you can only get 1 million back from the electrical engineer so there's 1.8 so just to just add one final step here why that is important for engineers and design professionals, they tend to not have a lot of cash or a lot of assets, right? They, 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 their PL policy is usually one of their biggest assets on the PL. So if something like this does go wrong, just because the damage is 2.8, that doesn't necessarily mean the design professional has 2.8 to give to the GC, and they're often relying on that insurance policy to give those amounts. So if the insurance policy is exhausted, there's typically not that much money left in the pot, and that's how our protective indemnity steps in. 
And then really finally, I just want to kind of go over contractors key. Um, really what this is, it's, it's, that same G, uh, it's that same general contract or artisan subcontractor policy, um, but it's on a very specific niche basis. Um, and the idea is here, we were trying to respond to a lot of, a lot of comments we hear back from um, some insureds, which is like, hey, that same thing. I don't understand the PL. I just need something to satisfy a contract so I can get to work on this. So this is our response here um, to that need to just provide simple E&L coverage to satisfy a contract so they can get to, get to work. So how is it different? It only covers one main project. That project has to be no more than five million in construction values. Um, they, we only give out two million in limits and we're really giving the really part back coverage, right? So really just that pure, P, uh, PL exposure. Premium is fully under inception um, and then we have a very limited targeted market for this um, and the policies have to annually renew. So in a normal project specific um, scenario you usually get if it's an 18 month policy you'll get a project for 18 months. For us we just do this annually and it, and it auto renews um, from there. But one of the nice things is, is if you have them in for this one project and then six months down the road they have another project where they, they also need contractors policy. Um, what we can do is we can do this flex to grow option where we can essentially convert their project specific policy, contractors keep us uh, policy into a full blown contractors practice policy for all of their projects. Um, and, that's, and that's kind of really the intent when we talk about getting the foot in the door is let, let us help you get one contract. And as you realize you need it for, for multiple, we can just actually flex this up into a full policy and often that's cheaper than going getting multiple uh, project specific policies on a project specific market. Um, who's eligible? Construction and installation only um, GCs um, in, in those following areas uh, kind of outlined there so generally on the lower hazard pieces we're not we're not looking to adversely select ourselves um, by taking on the highest and hairiest exposures. Um, also, we do, um, in that same vein, exclude certain projects for contractors key, right? So really you kind of big hairy stuff, uh, airports, terminals, runways, condo townhomes, um, tract homes, subdivisions, demolition work, um, glazing window contractors that are um, always subject to higher pollution claims because of um, water intrusion, um, harbors, piers, those big kind of hairy hairy project types um, but if it's kind of commercial it's clean it's offices it's um, retail things like that um, then certainly in scope so it's just another way to think about Hiscox another way to way to sell contractors and a way to get your foot in the door with these um, insureds um, so we can look to kind of upgrade them and really educate them on the value of a, of a full policy um, later down the line. So thank you, Jay. What, what a great job. What good information. I learned uh, I learned some things myself. So I want to thank you all for joining us. And uh, again, if you have any questions, chat them in. Um, uh, and even if we, uh, if we, we uh, in the, the webinar, we'll make sure we get you an answer from uh, Jay or Lexi as needed. Uh, please visit our website at cidinsurance.com. We've got lots of tools and lots of webinars to watch that are recorded there. There, This one will be there as well, and Jacob will be sending it out to you so you can view it again and pass it around in the office. Uh, it, if you uh, want to get a professional quote, uh, please contact Lexi. She's She answers her phone and answers her emails, and we'll get you a quote in a timely manner. So we look forward to doing business with you, and thank you for joining today.